Have you ever thought what makes a problem wicked? Not just difficult, but wicked. Well, the German design theorist Horst de Rittel studied wicked problems and in the 1970s came up with a useful definition. A wicked problem defines, defies solutions for four reasons. Firstly, because of a contested scientific basis. Secondly, because of the number of actors involved. Thirdly, because of the economic burden. And fourthly, because of the interconnectedness with other problems. Global heating is the wickedest problem of all. In addition to the four reasons, there is a fifth one, namely time. Originating in the Industrial Revolution, global heating has deep historic roots and the consequences of current emissions will reach far into the future. In fact, they will shape life on planet Earth for millennia. The dramatic effects of a changing climate are summarized in the easily Googled 2021 Doomsday Clock statement. It has been said that we are the first generation that experiences global heating and the last that can do anything about it. Time is of the essence and we are running out of it. It is less than two minutes to midnight. Every day the news carry reports on hurricanes, wildfires, droughts, floods, species extinction, and yes, zoonotic infections in which animal diseases are naturally transmitted to human beings. COVID-19 is the latest, but certainly not the worst nor the last. Not as long as the stress on nature continues. Alarmingly, some 75% of emerges, emerging infectious diseases worldwide are exchanged between wild animals and humans. Think West Nile, Lyme, Ebola, MERS, SARS, Zika. The deadly Ebola outbreak has been linked to deforestation in Africa and to virus spillover from consumption of primates or bats that place hunters, consumers and wildlife at risk. The coronavirus started as a viral transfer from bats. Because of natural habitat destruction, horseshoe bats in China were forced into cities. Under increased stress, the bats shed viruses that were picked up by people in an early infection cluster. COVID-19 was not a black swan, but precisely predicted, as is the next pandemic and the consequences of global heating. As the cartoon, it appeared in The Economist a year ago, illustrates COVID-19 is a trial run for the much bigger, wickeder crisis that is coming down the pike. There are instructive similarities between COVID-19 and global heating. Both are the consequence of anthropogenic interventions in nature's equilibrium. Both occur globally at the same time. Both can be understood and solved only on the basis of scientific insights. Neither are matters of belief or faith, even if both attract conspiracy myths and sectarians. Both are so dimensioned that they can only be solved politically at the global level. The market cannot fix them, nor can individual action. Naturally, the engagement of citizens, of communities, of companies is important yet in support of political action, not instead. What distinguishes both crises? The difference is instructive because not every difficult or painful or expensive misfortune is necessarily a wicked problem. COVID-19 is not a wicked problem, but an emergency that can be managed or mismanaged as various countries around the world illustrate. Social distancing, strict hygiene, and importantly, vaccines protect against COVID-19. Social distancing and frequent hand washing will not work against global heating and there will not be a vaccine. COVID-19 can be contained by national measures, global heating only through international coordination and cooperation. <clears throat> COVID-19 has peaked and the curve will flatten. Global heating in contrast 
is a geological phenomenon that can be slowed down, best case scenario, but not reversed. COVID-19 is time limited, hopefully. Global heating is irreversible. The basics of anthropogenic global warming have been understood since the early 19th century and it can easily be established by Googling, for example, Joseph Fourier, Claude Pouillet, John Tyndall, Swante Arrhenius, or Eunice Foote, who incidentally, since she was a woman, had some of her research findings presented by male colleagues. The essence of their discovery is that greenhouse gas molecules in the atmosphere absorb and trap the sun's heat that hits the earth and is reflected back into space. The more greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, the less heat escapes from the earth into outer space and the higher the earth's median temperature. Today, this is taught the school kids. The temperature rises in tandem with greenhouse gas emissions as foreseen by the models. The science, to repeat, has been understood for a very long time. I was delighted recently to come across this news item from the New Zealand Rodney and Otamatia times of 109 years ago. Its calculation is absolutely correct, stunningly so, but its prediction is off because the amount of carbon actually emitted was simply unimaginable in the 20th century. The effect of carbon dioxide emissions is of course considerable, yet not in a few centuries only as was thought then, but in little more than one century. Carbon dioxide, the biggest contributor to global heating, is an infinite greenhouse gas, so-called because as a cumulative pollutant, it stays in the atmosphere for centuries. This is highly relevant in the context of international negotiations on climate mitigation. Since today's warming is both a stock issue, namely the cumulative buildup over time and the flow issue, current emissions, the burden of reductions cannot in fairness be the same for all countries. The industrial revolution, which was highly energy intensive, laid the basis for the current wealth in North America, Europe, Japan, and other industrialized countries. The world's industrialized countries account for three quarters of the historic emissions, all developing countries together only for the remaining quarter. Until the Industrial Revolution, primary energy sources, as you can see in this beautiful 19. 1652 painting, primary energy sources supporting human life were plants for food, either directly or through meat and biomass for warmth and light. Water, wind, and animal, as well as human muscles, provided mechanical energy to power mills, to pull plows, and to transport cargo. All these energy sources were climate neutral and had practically no effect on the composition of the atmosphere. They only slightly speeded up the natural decay processes that continually recycle carbon from the biosphere to the atmosphere. The use of coal ruptured the shackles of direct photosynthesis and real-time use of biomass as humanity's main energy source. The Industrial Revolution enabled a truly Faustian transgression, namely for humans to reach into the Earth's store of millions of years of plant matter, converted by solar energy into coal, oil, and gas. And what a conversion. A single gallon of gasoline consists of about 100 tons of ancient plants and sea life. Coal fueled the Industrial Revolution. It converted heat into mechanical power, such as in steam engines, and movement, such as in railways and ships. Oil was first struck in 1859 in Pennsylvania. Oil supplanted coal in importance after World War II, when cars, airplanes, and mechanical agriculture 
mechanized agriculture began to change the world. Excavating and burning fossil fuels, the sun's energy stored for eons in ever greater quantity, laid the basis for the upsurge of productivity, production, and mass consumption. No doubt, scientific and technological advances also were catalysts of the great acceleration after World War II, but it was the burning of fossil fuel in ever greater quantities that catapulted humanity into the modern age of mass production and mass consumption. A few generations of humanity are burning the fossil fuels that were generated over several hundred million years. This stunning excess is problematic not because, as was thought still a few decades ago, it exhausts finite resources. No, it is problematic because it destroys the natural life support systems on which animals, humans and plants depend. Thirty some years ago, this began to sink in. The United Nations General Assembly in 1988 passed the first resolution on the dangers of global warming and established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. A few weeks later, Time magazine declared Earth Planet of the Year with a compelling cover photo. Yet more carbon dioxide has been emitted since 1988 than in all of prior history. The explosive economic and population growth after World War II is called the Great Acceleration. Economic miracles happened in many parts of the world, especially in those devastated by the war. Europe, Japan, North America, not devastated but affected by the war. Growth became a fetish everywhere. No plateau has been reached yet, and further growth is projected. However, the Earth's carrying capacity is being exceeded. In the 1960s, 70s and 80s, climate science was a technical challenge. It was not politically contested. Following on the signature year 1988, the Rio Earth Summit of 1992 established the Framework Convention on Climate Change. In Paris in, 90, in 2015, it was the 21st annual meeting, was a splendid success diplomatically. It was unanimously agreed to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. To submit voluntary yet ever more stringent reduction pledges and thirdly, to establish a green climate fund to support developing countries' mitigation and ad ad adaptation efforts. Yet agreeing is not the same as doing, and targets are easier set than met. Not a single industrialized country is on target to fulfilling its Paris commitments. And the Green Climate Fund has little money. Negotiated agreements are voluntary, non-binding, and unenforceable. They promote free riding. This does not necessarily mean that they are useless, only that they have limited utility. They are not magical weapons. They are more like New Year's resolutions. Multilateral fora have important convening standard setting, monitoring and validating functions, which is not to be sneezed at, but also not to be overrated. The remedial decarbonization and conservation measures that are on the US, the EU and the UK drawing boards are considerably more than could have been expected even two years ago but they are still not anywhere near the appropriate scale to keep global heating below a safe threshold. This is not because scientific insights are contested. It is because 
They are inconvenient and therefore ignored. Lip service is being paid, yet action not taken at the scale and speed commensurate with the challenge. The defense of privilege is a major obstacle for decarbonization policies within and among countries. The rich will not pay and the poor cannot pay. The interconnectedness of global heating with other problems, mainly economic inequality, stands in the way of real as opposed to rhetorical solutions. Global heating is an unprecedented global public policy challenge with emphasis on unprecedented on global public policy and challenge. Solutions exist, affordable ones, technically feasible ones, and universally beneficial ones, all of which though are politically very hard to attain because the many actors involved have different short-term interests and because the economic burden now blinds to future benefits. Except when circumstances leave no other choice, politicians' preferred framing of issues is in terms of doability, not necessity. This proclivity also handicaps solutions to the wicked problem of global heating. With the climate endgame in sight, there is no reasonable doubt that incremental greening will not do the trick, that disruptive change is unavoidable, and that options are receding. Even a 50% drop in emissions this decade would not stop the rise in temperature. It would only slow things down, somewhat postponing but not preventing climate catastrophe. Soon, nature will have taken over, and then um, whatever humans do will simply not be enough anymore. Barry Commoner, a hero of the environment movement 50 years ago, defined four laws of ecology, namely that everything is connected to everything else, everything must go somewhere, nature knows best, and there is no such thing as a free lunch. The struggle for human civilization, for the survival of human civilization is in full swing. Do learn about the issues, do get involved, and prove those wrong who think that there is no problem or that it is too late anyway, or that nothing can be done or that the problem is too wicked because solutions are impossible, difficult or costly. Work for zero emissions, it can be done and it must be done.